Good morning, everyone. Hello. I hope everyone can hear me. Um, it is my distinct honor and pleasure, frankly, to kick off this really unique and, um, and frankly, almost groundbreaking accelerator program um, it called what up, O-U-A-T up, and you all might be asking, what does that mean? And I'll explain that shortly. But before doing that, uh, let me introduce myself. My name is Tomas Debas. I am part of the team that brought this program together um, for you. And, um, and so this program, as we are waiting for everyone to uh, log in, uh, it's been a... a a passion of uh, uh, a passion project that we've been working for a very long time, and it's so beautiful to um, to reach this milestone where we uh, where we commence this program, this accelerator virtual program, to you today. I know we had a full start um, uh, last week. Thank you for your patience uh, as we try to figure out this Zoom land. Um, but I will guarantee you that this would be a program that will uh, literally change your trajectory as, a, as an aspiring filmmaker. So what up OUAT up? OUAT is an acronym for once upon a time, which as we all know uh, of children of stories, every story starts with what OUAT, what once upon a time. And it's that's where the, the, the name is uh, inspired from and it is also, the accelerator program is, um, you know, intimately modeled uh, after the startup accelerator programs. So, this is a concept where we would like to accelerate film ideas, uh, similar to what uh, startup accelerators do. But our desire and passion is to help you, uh, uh, the young folks around the world, uh, globally, who have a story to tell. And, and we would like to help you put those stories to bring them to life. And so it is, um, it is, it is a, a very unique program in that perspective. And also, also a program that is a, a collaboration with uh, the Smart Film Festival, uh, which we'll talk a little bit about that. Uh, also Filmic Pro, which is, uh, it makes uh, an amazing um, uh, camera app within, uh, uh, within the phone system. Um, also Lumitat, which is an editing software. Also for those of you who are uh, tuning in from Ethiopia, uh, the creative agency Zeliman, uh, uh, which has been a, um, a backbone of putting this program together on the ground. Uh, so this is a true collaboration with all these organizations, but the main one I wanna uh, emphasize is the School of Communication at American University, which this program today is being led by uh, Professor Kylos Brennan and, um, and also a good friend, Professor Larry Engel. And uh, so the context of this program essentially is we are putting together a series of sessions between today, July 1st to end of August, where we're gonna, um, uh, today's gonna be kicking off a masterclass about how do you make it, uh, how do you tell your stories through the, through the, the smartphone uh, but we will have a series of these sessions that will go on until end of August on every value chain or every aspect of filmmaking from an idea to scripts to, to showcasing them to film festivals and, and, and studios. Uh, so that's what this program is all about. And um, I also want to introduce um, our amazing team on the ground in Ethiopia, um, um, Mike McConnell and Helen Salomon who are gonna be your POC, your, your main point of contact moving forward. So lean on them. I know you're already engaged with them, but uh, they, they will be your, your main point of contact for moving forward. And, and the reason, and this is a, a program that, is, that we're setting up for the entire world. And, but the reason we're starting in Ethiopia is not just because we have roots and, 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 and partners on the ground, but it's also fitting to do it in Ethiopia because Ethiopia is the birth of humanity. And the first story was ever told was probably from Ethiopia. So it is important for us to kick off this program in Ethiopia. And for those of you who have been selected to be in this program, uh, about 63 of you, uh, take that responsibility well. We are leaning on you. Take 
taking all the information that you're getting, you're getting world-class level of mentorship and support and, and training. And we really, really look forward to, to watch your films uh, at the film festival in September. And, and, and so at that note, um, before I pass the microphone uh, to Professor Kailos, uh, briefly, I want to speak in, in Amharic. Um, uh, ማ <laughs> ከጀመረው <laughs> We look forward to to be in this um, in this um, you know in this journey in this uh, in this storytelling journey. So on that note, I'll pass the microphone to you, uh, Kylos, and and I'll put myself on mute. Thank you. Hello, all. Thank you so much for having me. <clears throat> um getting set up here just for a moment. All right, uh, welcome to today's webinar. I wanna first off thank everyone for attending. I also wanna thank um, our hosts with Smart Film Festival. And as uh, Tomas just said, all our sponsors, I really appreciate it. Um, <clears throat> I am uh, Professor Kylo Brannon. I am a professor at American University in Washington, DC. I do a lot of smartphone filmmaking in my work uh, locally, I do a lot of video production for theater companies, and I spent years working in museums producing uh, <clears throat> graphics and video um, for various museums, not just in the D.C. area, but around the United States. Uh, and I'm excited to be here with you today because I think these are amazing. I think smartphone filmmaking is revolutionary, and it's changing and has been changing and has already changed the way we're communicating, the way we're creating media, and the way we're creating films, whether they are narrative, experimental, uh, music videos, documentary, anything. Um, <clears throat> oh, and I also want to uh, thank Professor Larry Engel, my colleague who's on the Zoom with me. You all will get to meet him in some future uh, sessions. He'll be diving deeper into some storytelling concept, concepts and into deeper camera work. Uh, though I will do a little bit of camera work today. Which brings me to what are we doing today? Well, the goal here today, my smartphone workshops and webinars, demonstrations, are intended to get you up and running, able to shoot something right away, thoughtfully, deliberately, with, we'll say, some tips and tricks in your back pocket that are going to help you hit the ground running. And honestly, to make a better edit because the films you make are made in the edit. That's me because I'm a post-production person. I love editing, but you got to get it here first. Um, I'm going to talk to you about things specific to the smartphone. I'm also going to talk to you about concepts that are universal for filmmaking. The things we've been doing for a hundred years or more have not changed, no matter what camera you put in your hand. Some of the ways you do that changes to, as technology changes. So <clears throat> with that, I'm gonna get started in just a second. Uh, if you have questions or comments, you're welcome to put it into the chat on YouTube. Uh, since I'm balancing multiple screens and my slides here, 
I may or may not see it, but I have a team working with me. They should be able to pass me some questions to answer as we go. Feel free to ask questions as we go. I'll try my best to respond. Um, and we can also do a follow-up if you want to contact us through uh, the contacts through smart, uh, the smartphone crew, um, if there's anything you want to know after this webinar that I can help you with. So with that, we should get started. So today we're doing smartphone, smart film filmmaking, smart filmmaking with a ph um that's me from media arts american university glad to be here let's get rolling we're going to discuss ways to casually to, i'm sorry <clears throat> we're going to discuss our ways to go from casually taking videos in with your phone to making deliberate choices and improving the production value of your smartphone videos so the first thing you want to do when you get out in the field on location doing your interview, whatever that is. You want to make sure that A, your battery is fully charged. Seems a little obvious, but we want to make sure our battery is fully charged. One thing that really slows down a production is when you have to stop and recharge your gear or <clears throat> if you have to grab a new battery. Although with smartphones, we may have external batteries, but we're probably going to have to plug it in somewhere, right? Uh, go into airplane mode. Now, historically with smartphones, airplane mode will cut back on the signal that's coming in to your phone, meaning there's less signals that might interfere with your recording. Now, over time, phones have gotten better, but we never know who's shooting with what. To tell you the honest truth, I hold, am holding on to two older phones of mine. I use them as backup cameras. They are not functional as phones anymore, but they still shoot as good of footage as they always did since the day I took them out of the box. So if you happen to be using an older phone, this is probably more important. Pairing with that, along with going into airplane mode, you probably, you may want to turn off Wi-Fi and Bluetooth. This is also cutting back on the amount of signals coming into your phone, depending on the phone itself or the age of the phone. It might drain some more battery if it's trying to keep that signal. And at the moment, you don't want it to be a phone. It never stops being a phone, that's true, but you don't want it to be a phone. You want it to be a camera. That's its primary purpose when you're on set. You don't want alerts happening while you're filming. You wanna be in the moment looking through your shot and thinking about that. Um, clean your lens. Uh, you can use just a normal, um, I use my eyeglasses rags that I have that I get with when I get new eyeglasses or uh, sunglasses. You can also buy decent lens cleaning gear or in a pinch, just a nice soft, clean piece of cloth. Get rid of extra media and apps if you want. So here's the case on that. Um, if you delete or back up all the photos and videos you have, or as many as you can, off your phone and free up that space, you're going to record longer. You're going to get more footage. Excuse me. You're going to be able to um, run a longer day and get more to work with. You can also delete, we'll say, the obvious shots you aren't going to use on the fly. I tend to do that when I'm out shooting in the field. Um, I also know my colleague, uh, Larry, who's on the Zoom here watching. I know that he says he removes all the extra media and all the apps that aren't necessary before he shoots. I'm gonna tell you between you and I, I usually ain't got time for that, but I will back up a bunch of my photos and video, free up space so that I don't have to take a moment and delete on the fly. It's gonna save you time, especially if you're shooting things that <clears throat> Are, uh, we'll say there's variables involved, maybe a live event, like um, a parade, you know, things are going to happen, they're going to move along, you're going to lose that moment, you know, um, a speech, a concert, uh, you know, a group of friends even just hanging out, and you're documenting their conversations, um, <clears throat> they, uh, that'll move along, and you'll lose time if you have to spend time deleting on the fly. So prep that in advance. Now, this one is very important. Test your sound and your image before you start shooting. This can be right away. This can be days in advance. 
sound will sink your film if it's not good. And we'll get back to sound in a few minutes, so I'm not going to talk too much about it. And I'm going to repeat some of this too, but repetition is important. It sticks things in our brains. So test the sound of the image before you start shooting to the best extent that you can. Ideally, if you're shooting something that you have control over and you have a location you have access to, go there in advance. So for example, <clears throat> maybe I'm shooting, uh, let's say I have an alley here behind my house. I'm shooting in that alley and I know I'm gonna do it right before sunset next week. Now, barring weather will, you know, changes, but I can do my best to predict that or, you know, know what the weather forecast is. I might want to go another weekday at around the same time, shoot some test shots and think, sit, pay attention to where the lighting is and think about what I hear. <clears throat> is this a busy time of day in this neighborhood, this area? Uh, is there a lot of background noise? Am I going to be able to compensate for that? Should I find a new location? <clears throat> it's very important to know about your sound situation in advance or anything that's going on in that location in advance if you can. So um, that's our setting up the phone and getting prepared. Uh, <clears throat> further things we might want to do that would help us in our preparation is bring a separate battery pack or portable charger, especially if you're shooting somewhere that doesn't have, you know, you're not inside with plugs. I do have a little portable phone charger that I can use if I need to. I keep it in my backpack just for everyday use, but I bring it along when I'm shooting. Um, although I try to be fully charged before I go on location. Uh, determine in advance whether you want to be shooting vertical, whether you've got it set to be a square, or whether you're gonna shoot horizontal and stick to it. Now, is breaking that rule terrible if you don't stick to it? Not necessarily, it's not the worst thing, but in editing and in viewing, in streaming, in posting to YouTube, posting to Instagram, posting to Facebook, posting to whatever it is you wanna post it to, a consistent framing is better because it's going to be a better experience for your audience and it's going to look more professional. Switching between horizontal, square, or vertical on the fly in your edit might make it look, might, not always, but might make it look like uh, an amateur piece if you do it without reason. Now, I personally am still attached to the horizontal. This is how our television screens are oriented how our film screens when we go to the theater are oriented and even YouTube, you know, still leans towards the horizontal format. Plus I think composition horizontally is nicer, but maybe I'm biased being that I grew up pre-smartphone and I got into filmmaking as a graduate student in my twenties and the only phones we had then shot very grainy, very, very low quality video, which was fun for its own reasons but I'm still partial to the horizontal. However, if you know that you're going to put this on a stream that will appear on people's phones in a certain orientation and you want it to be square or vertical, do it that way. Do whatever works for your project. I can tell you that in my own experience, I shoot and create ads for productions I work on and I will shoot them horizontally but I will consider the framing of a square and make sure that my composition concentrates on that so that if I crop it down to a square to be sent out um, for formats that are more prone to square or vertical, which square would work fine in a vertical, most anyway, maybe not TikTok, but we're gonna, we're gonna set TikTok aside. I don't wanna talk about that too much because that's a whole different level of, we'll say production considerations, different than what we're doing here. Um, looping back. <clears throat> I will shoot horizontally, but keep in mind that I'm going to make a version of this that is square for uh, my theater company's Instagram feed. And I want to make sure that that crop works. So I'll keep that in mind. Um, determine over square. If possible, shoot 4K. 
So if your phone can do a 4K setting, it's best to have as many pixels, as high quality as you can. And uh, also, if you don't feel like you have a lot of space and you don't think you're going to need, we'll say a 4K level of resolution, you can bump that down in your settings so that you take up less space. But my recommendation is always get as many pixels as high of resolution as you can, because you can always export smaller. You can always crop into that and get a uh, close up that maybe you didn't shoot. And then the last two notes here are accidentally repeated from the previous slide. But what I'm gonna say is I wanna stress them. So I put them in twice. Roll with your mistakes. That's a good filmmaking tick. tip. Um, get rid of that extra media in the apps and test your sound and image before you start filming, which I will probably say again. So actually we do wanna stress that, test it, test it in advance. You'll be happy. You won't know it, but you'll be happier because that thing that happens that catches you off guard, that ruins the shoot, it may not happen if you test in advance. Okay, next slide. We're gonna talk about the three C's. The three C's are control, composition, and coverage. And these are what you wanna think about in constructing your shoot and how the camera works with image, how the image works with editing and how the sound brings it all together. This is going to be the three things that you want to keep in mind. So three categories. Our first C is control. Now this relates a little bit to setting up the camera, but it's a little bit more specific too. So you wanna lock your focus and exposure. There's an autofocus and probably auto exposure in your uh, phone already. If you can use an app to help you control that, that's a good idea. Now, selecting an appropriate brightness and camera subject distance and sticking to that. Now, of course, this might change if you're doing a move, the sun changes and goes behind a cloud, um, or if you work with one subject and they walk away from you, there's gonna be more distance. There are a lot of variables. This is a moving image. It's going to change and move. But what you want to avoid and the reason you're doing this, you want to avoid the camera changing and making a different choice of focus or exposure. Now, if I take this camera and I were to just leave it on auto and I were to pan around my environment right now, I know you can't see it, but you can probably tell on my right here, there's sun coming in to my right. There's no sun inside my house to the left. If I start over here with autofocus, it's going to expose for those shadows and then change its mind when I get over here. Is that terrible? No, but a good, experienced, deliberate filmmaker sets their exposure in the shot and keeps it consistent. Are there times to let it change or change it on your own? Sure, that can happen. But let's start with acting as professional as we can learn the rules and then mess with them or break them. And I encourage my students and I encourage you to go out there and mess with your settings, break the rules, but try to follow them first. Try to look like a professional who knows what they want, even if you don't, fake it. Um, so we wanna set our focus, set our exposure and keep it consistent. Don't let the camera change its mind. What I always say when I see my students work in auto settings and it changes, the word I use is that pulsed in a shot, that the focus went in and out and changed, or suddenly our exposure got dark in the foreground and, and lightened in the background or pulled down our highlights and changed back. It almost always happens twice. So I'll tell my students, try to avoid the pulsing. You don't want that to happen. Now, apps <clears throat> like Filmic Pro, which is one of our sponsors, I also recommend to my students sometimes Movie Pro. There's, there's new ones every day. We love Filmic Pro here. They, they allow, these apps allow for auto exposure, um, auto focus, and auto white balance for you to lock them so it stays consistent. There's many other apps on the market if you search. Find the one that works for you, although we are going to recommend Filmic Pro because they are our friends. And I would say it is probably the best production app I've ever used. I really, really like it. And <clears throat> um, yeah, and we're not going to get in editing. So I'll keep my editing app to the side, although LumaFusion is also one of our sponsors. Excellent editing app. But you'll get to more post-production further along in the WhatsApp program. <clears throat> now, if you're a photo person who works with, uh, we'll say, professional level DSLRs, this will mean something to you. 
<clears throat> that smartphones control exposure through shutter speed and uh, ISO, which is equivalent to film speed, or we'll say sensitivity of this chip, of the sensor. It doesn't have f-stop control. Um, f-stops are the width of the opening in your lens, how much light it len lets in. That is fixed in a phone, unless you add lenses to it, which is possible. But we're going to say you want to shoot with what's right now in your pocket, in your bag, whatever. So for photographers, that's an adjustment, or we'll say old school videographers, cinematographers, that's an adjustment they have to get used to. We just want to take note of that, that the the aperture that the f-stop is consistent and doesn't change. Shutter speed and sensitivity do change, and you can have more control over that through apps. What do we got next? Focus. So here we get into some shots. We're going to see some shots. Now, by the way, to let you know, I will be showing you some moving image, but for the purpose of my demonstrations, um, A, for seeing a shot and ingesting the shot and thinking about what's going on, <clears throat> and B, for efficiency of time, I tend to use still imagery so that I can talk about them at length and we can look at them. Now, when I talk about focus here, I want to mention that I'm talking about two things. Content-wise, what's the focus? And technically, what's the focus? So whether or not you see everything in focus or just something in focus, it all relates. So our first shot, obviously, the broken television is what's important. It's the quote unquote focus of the shot. What's in focus in the shot is everything all the way to the back, at least for the most part. So it creates an entire scene. Our second shot is similar. However, it doesn't have that focal point of one uh, character or subject. In this case, there was numerous characters sharing importance on screen, stretching back into the background. So the fact that our content is focused on numerous characters and we want them all in focus, technically, we want to make sure that we are set for that, that we get a nice deep focus and depth of field. If you don't know the term depth of field, it basically refers to <clears throat> what in the shot can be in focus at a certain distance. And this macro shot I have, which used a lens attached to my phone, actually, of the flower, that's a very shallow depth of field and brings one subject into focus while the rest is out of focus. Now, I'm talking about this conceptually, but how can this affect you practically? If you control your depth of field and control where the focus is, now, <clears throat> in my phone, I am an Apple user. So I live in all Apple existence. I have Apple computers. I have an Apple tablet. I have an Apple phone. I have an Apple watch. I got Apple everything. But these are fundamentals that apply to all phones. I just want to acknowledge my own bias towards Mac and Apple, but I do not uh, judge or pass judgment on any phone choices you have. However, I do know that in my iOS, I can control through selective focus. And in my iOS, in my phone, if I press down and hold until it locks, I will get focus in a particular area. Now you can see in this shot, hopefully, that the foreground is in focus and the background is not, making the foreground the important thing in this shot, the thing that we're focusing on. If we change our mind or we want options, we might, keep shooting this shot, cut, do another take of this same shot, but change the focus to the background. Now, this is a little dark, but hopefully you can see what's going on here. Now, my foreground elements, they are out of focus, and the background is in focus. So choosing that, knowing where you want that and locking it, very important, very important, especially because if you have a shot that's slightly soft or a little bit out of focus, and someone full screens that to watch it because they're very excited to watch your video on YouTube. They full screen it. That soft focus shot will stick out, especially if everything else is nicely, cleanly, clearly in focus. So 
control, control your camera, control your focus. Color temperature. So <clears throat> I'm not going to get into the deeper dive into color temperature, but let's just say, looking at this scale, if you look across the bottom, it corresponds to different lighting situations, stretching from a light that is very red to a light that is very blue. Now, this is not like in situations where you actually have a gel or a filter on a light that makes it like blue or like red, right? This is a tint is how I refer to it. It affects the way our eyes receive the shot. Now, your eyes naturally white balance. You probably rarely notice that sunlight, a nice sunlight day, has a little bit of a blue tint to it. You probably rarely notice that a normal everyday bulb inside, a common tungsten bulb is kind of orange, a little orange. It's a little hard to see it here, but fluorescents tend to actually be kind of green. Some of them are actually a little pink. Candles are rare, very, very warm. So fire lights and candles are very, very warm. Now, the thing is, this might be what you want. You might want that tint. You might want the feel that comes from different kinds of lights, but you wanna be able to control that white balance because if you don't, different shots may have different color tints. It's true. When your eye filters this out and you see things without that tint, it's something we've evolved to do. Your camera may not, unless you tell it to or unless you're aware of it. Now, the best way to sort of see this is to actually look at shots set to different white balances. And you'll see here, we're getting different um, uh, <clears throat> tinting, different uh, hues creeping through. The top left is white balanced, so the light looks pretty much white. The other ones are set to different settings inaccurately. One comes off a little bit more orange down here, one's a little bit more yellow, and one's very blue-green. Now, these all offer different feelings to the shot, so there's nothing wrong with, like I said before, experimenting, um, messing with your settings, seeing where it goes. but you want to control it in the end. So make that choice wisely. My suggestion, especially if you're a beginner, is to white balance for the moment you're in and white balance for every different location or set you shoot in so that it is consistent. Because you can also always tint in post to varying effectiveness, but it is a possibility. Sound, we want to control sound, we need to control sound. So I'm going to tell you a little bit of a bit of advice. I have a friend, his name is John Gann. Uh, he ran a long running, very successful film festival here in Washington, DC, uh, DC Shorts, which is a wonderful film festival, nothing but short films, really great opportunity to see interesting work going on. Look it up if you want to send your films out internationally. Just a little plug for my friend there. However, what he always says to students when I bring him in to talk to students is, you can make a fantastic film, but if my audience can't understand what's being said, I can't put it in front of an audience. A lot of students are very obsessed with getting that beautiful shot, that awesome, exposure, that really smooth camera movement, and they'll ignore sound and think, I'll fix it later. It doesn't work like that very easily, in fact, rarely well. So get good sound. Um, the other thing he says is he'll tell students that if your video is slightly overexposed or slightly underexposed, but we can tell what's going on, an audience will think that's a creative choice. That's an artistic choice. It adds the mood and feel. But if they can't understand your characters, they can't understand your interview, they can't understand your narration, there's no story. They drop right out. 
So why am I stressing this so hard? Because I want you to pay attention to it. Smartphones usually don't allow you to monitor sound or set levels. I know that has been changing over time with certain apps. I believe that Filmic Pro now will let you monitor. I think I read that recently. Um, but when I say you can't monitor, it's that you can't listen through the mic as you shoot. Now, I might be wrong in certain models. I don't have every model. I don't have them all up to date, but traditionally they don't. And also, it doesn't hurt to be prepared and to pay attention to your first C, control. Shoot a test and play it back and listen to it. I'm going to be shooting here in this house, this time of day. I come here the day before I shoot, and I shoot different positions around the room. I shoot closer to the windows. I shoot closer to the kitchen. I can hear that refrigerator in the background. In fact, I can hear it right now. Um, certain times of day, traffic might be heavier than others. I can hear it. I hear it in the background. Well, maybe if I'm shooting at this time of day, I don't want to get that close to the windows or make sure the windows are shut. Whatever you can do to help you control that sound. Now, ideally, we want to try to eliminate extraneous sound. So get close to the sound source. That's not going to work in every single, every single possible situation. But you want to, again, control things. And if you're doing an interview, for example, you want to be close in the space of that interview. You want to be close to the people that you're listening to and the dialogue that you're filming. If you can't get <clears throat> much closer, there are other options. There are mics made for smartphones. There's also the idea, like I said, I keep extra old phones around. You can set one up to just record sound and set it close to the person that you're recording. Just get their sound and marry it, sync it to the video later in your editing. It's an extra step and it brings in a certain amount of difficulty, but it might save you. It might give you what you need. Um, wind is the enemy of good sound. Wind is tough. If you're in a windy environment, my advice is get out of it, especially if you don't have extra gear. Indoors, your enemies are going to be things like air conditioning and appliances, refrigerators, which I just said I could hear mine. Maybe you can't over the mic. It's very possible you can't, but I can hear it. And I know that if I was recording a scene today in this room, that background refrigerator would show up. A tip and trick for you. If you're shooting inside and there's a refrigerator and it kicks in, it, it makes noise in the background, you're going to want to turn it off. However, you got to remember to turn it back on. So one little filmmaker trip trick that we do is, uh, if possible, put something in there that you know you will need before you leave. For most of us, those are car keys. If you put your car keys in the refrigerator, you can't get into your car and leave without them. That way, when you go back to get your car keys, you'll be like, oh, I better turn the refrigerator back on. All my ice cream is going to melt. Or, you know, your aunt's ice cream, who was nice enough to let you use her house. You don't want her to come back later in the evening after you've made this wonderful film and you appreciate her letting her, her house be your set for the day. And she's lost all her ice cream. They're sad. All her leftovers have gone bad because you did not turn the refrigerator back on. If not car keys, think of something else that you need before you leave and put that in there. So refrigerators, very, very bad noise in the background. So watch out for background noise, wind, traffic, air conditioners, other appliances. Try to eliminate them where you can or get some distance from them so they're background. They start falling into the background and we can hear the people who are on camera. Okay, <clears throat> our second C for the day is composition. And I'm gonna include in that movement. So composition is how you arrange your frame, how you put things into that shot. And we want you to be doing it like a pro. We want you to do it as well as someone who's been shooting with a camera for decades. And you know what? They use the same rules you will. They may have more experience. It might come a little more naturally, but they use the exact same concepts that you will. 
These things have not changed. So I'm going to go over the rule of thirds, shot types, camera movement, and some tips and tricks. So first of all, our rule of thirds. You'll see here, these are stills from two interviews I shot. And a fun fact, one is shot with a smartphone and one is not. I like to put them next to each other to just say, is there a major difference here? Now, of course, one is lit with more window, one is lit at night with extra lighting, but they're both pretty clear shots. The interviews were great either way. However, I bring up these shots to show you that the subjects of these interviews, shot with a smartphone or not, incorporated the rule of thirds. Now, what is the rule of thirds? You might know it. For those of you out there who probably have experienced shooting and have been out there doing it for years, you might have already been told what this is. If you've taken a class in photography or filmmaking, videography, you've almost definitely been told this. But let's stress the important things more than once so we're thinking about them. The rule of thirds breaks the frame into equal thirds and creates this sort of tic-tac-toe kind of uh, grid. And what we say, I, I also like to start with interviews and we'll say, you know, decent close-ups to medium close-ups of subjects, because the first thing I tell my students is frame your subjects so that their eyes are on this top horizontal. No matter your distance to the subject, that will help you determine headspace. Now, there's not a lot of difference in these shots, but uh, Shannon on the left here has a little bit of headspace, depending on how she moved, that came and went. And Mignote on the right, actually we're cutting off a little bit above her hairline, but she's falling out of the frame slightly. That little bit of difference makes some uh, uh, difference in your shot, makes some variety and makes it specific. But by putting their eyes on that eye line, on that horizontal, it helps me dictate, based on their distance, how much headroom there might be. The other thing to do when you're working with a subject, with people, whether they are in an interview or if they're in dialogue, talking to each other, is to place their body along that, the vertical, along the vertical that allows them to look into the shot. Whoops, I clicked when I didn't mean to. So when I say look into the shot is we want the extra space to be ahead of them in the direction that their eyes are going. That creates a really nice composition. It's a little off center. Their eyes are along that horizontal. You do not have to be truly strict about it. Now, I tend to put the vertical a little bit towards the back of their head, where their head sits in the frame. Other people want this eye on that vertical or maybe even the nose right down the center on that vertical. That's up to you. That's creative license. Um, as long as you're doing this deliberately and using your rule of thirds, you'll find it helps create consistency uh, well-composed imagery. And <clears throat> if you have two people talking to each other and you shoot both of them, you get footage of both of them, whether it's dialogue in something you've written or an interview. If you put their eyes on this horizontal, when you edit it together, it'll look like they're looking at each other. That's extremely important. Because if I were to cut these two together, they are obviously not in the same space, but the framing would make them look like they were more or less looking at each other's faces into each other's eyes while they talk. If one of them was dropped real low, their eye line would be down here and the other eye line would be way up here. And in the edit, it would look like they were talking, one person was talking to someone's chin and the other person was talking to someone's head. head. So it's also good for the edit. This doesn't just count in framing people, also in framing the environment around them or the entire, we'll say, form in the shot. In this one on the left, uh, not an interview, just a shot in general. We still have the eyes. We still have the character placed on a vertical. In this particular case, the eyes are looking into the shot over the shoulder. But you'll see that that 
horizontal and vertical lines correspond to many more things in the shot. This diagonal cuts right through that. That diagonal leads us back to the background and the background, well, it does vary. This is Pittsburgh. Um, you'll see that this horizontal corresponds to some of the skyline. That's actually helping to frame and create a good flow in the composition. Now I bring this shot in over here. This is just a modeling shot I did in college because of it fits a vertical. So this doesn't go away when you shoot vertically. You still want to incorporate your rule of thirds. We've got the eye here, the body on one vertical, but she rests in the frame on that horizontal. This hand is over here on this vertical close to that intersection. And it just helps create a nice, again, little flow in the shot. Now I've been concentrating on people and that is a good way to look at the rule of thirds, but it isn't something that goes away when we shoot other types of shots. So both these shots are using the rule of thirds in different ways. In this shot, we have a subject on our vertical. Uh, the <clears throat> shot wants to have the entirety of the subject digging into the ground here. We want them to have a nice deep background. We got that focus, both the focus of the background being in focus, but also this subject being framed well on the vertical using the rule of thirds helps us focus on the content. We also have it framed so that the subject, the person is over on that vertical. So we get a nice framing here of a background. So our foreground background is coming to play in the grid. Over here, we only have background. Our foreground is actually negative space. Now, I know the camera person who shot this. He's on the Zoom with us. And he was talking to us about this shot last week. And he mentioned that these shots were composed to make you feel, as the audience, a little bit ill at ease, a little bit uncomfortable. So it takes the composition, it still uses it well, but it places it low in the frame. There's kind of an odd angle here that gives us an, uh, a low angle shot where the interesting parts of the shot, the action, if you will, is at the intersection that's low in the frame rather than high and gives us both this extreme framing that goes back in the background where the action is, but also creates negative space over here that is an unusual approach. You can still use this rule and change it up a little bit to create different moods, different feelings, to affect your audience in different ways. Types of shots. So here's a bunch of different types of shots. You want to be able to speak in film language, in shooting language, and you want to be able to plan too. So one thing I make my students do in every project is to storyboard or create a shot list. In order to storyboard or create a shot list, you need a plan. And the plan involves knowing what kinds of shots you think you want. Once you're shooting, change your mind, get more shots, do different things, totally fine. But let's orient you for those who may not know, for the beginners out there, what are the types of shots we've got? This is a basic list. Some people break these down further, but I'm keeping you to five types of shots. And then three or four, we'll say types of shots related to camera position or subject. That's how I break these up. By the way, the way I break these up might be slightly different or the terminology I use might be slightly different than other instructors. A lot of this is kind of fluid. And a lot of people get used to using terms in certain ways. But the nice thing is that we do have a shared language. And if you can speak that shared language, you'll be able to also collaborate with your crew better. Maybe you want to direct and have someone else shoot the smartphone and fill, uh, footage you need. You need to be able to say to them, get in there for a nice close-up or a nice extreme close-up. And then your camera person knows what they're supposed to do for you. So what do we have here? We have an extreme wide shot. Wide shot, medium shots. Medium shots tend to be broken out into other versions. Talk about those in just a moment. Close up and extreme close up. Low, hang, low angle, high angle, and over the shoulder, and a two shot. I want to show you examples of all these. These are just here to give us examples in general, 
but we're going to jump into extreme wides versus wides. Extreme wides tend to show us an expansive area. They show us depth. They show us things going on in the background. You may still have something in the foreground, but if I had a subject standing here close to us, often then it'll be referred to by the subject as probably a medium or a close-up, even though that background is still that extreme wide. So this shot plays as an extreme wide because there's nothing else there but this expansive wide environment. Now this wide shot, as far as the background's concerned, it's still actually kind of an extreme wide, but the car is clearly the focal point content-wise of this shot. That is definitely a wide shot of that car. So these terms are also a little bit fluid depending on what you're shooting, what the important part of the shot is, and uh, what you want to bring attention to in your purpose. <clears throat> medium shots. So here's where I said medium shots tend to have a little bit of variety to them because, and we'll see a chart that will break it down. We have a medium shot, which is generally, we're gonna orient this to people. So we're going to orient this to people and we're going to say a normal medium shot, I'm going to make air quotes with my fingers, a normal medium shot is probably the body up, sort of your torso, part of your torso up to your head. The interviews I showed you would be probably considered close-ups because they're like here. But a medium shot gets about this. However, a medium shot can also be a little wider. We call them often tight mediums or uh, wide mediums, things like that. So we've got three versions of medium shots here. Uh, one is kind of more traditional medium shot. One is a little bit wider of a medium shot where we get these individuals here, a little bit more of their torso. Still using a rule of thirds, by the way, their heads are on the rule of thirds. This person's a little high up in the shot, but still along the rule of thirds. And down here, you can obviously see this subject is on the rule of thirds. That's a bit wider of a medium. Now, someone might actually refer to this one down here as a wide shot. This is where sometimes there's a little bit of fluidity. Pick what works best for you. I would call all three of these mediums. I might refine that, but I would call them mediums. Now, this is my cat. My cat has been licking at bald spots on his legs because he's been stressed because we moved. So he must wear a watermelon collar at the moment. I think he looks very cute in his watermelon collar. But I had my cat Oreo pose for these shots. And he is in a close up on our left. We see the full watermelon. We see his whole head. He's looking at us. He's asking us, why do I have to wear the watermelon? And it's because you won't stop licking the bald spots on your leg. Over on the right is an extreme close-up, obviously. We were zoomed way in there. We got real close to him with a macro lens and got his cute little nose in the shot. So difference between close-up and extreme close-up. High angle. Now this could be any type of shot. I've got wides here, one extreme wide, one we'll say just a normal wide, quote unquote, normal wide. The angle, is relative to the subject. So sometimes students will think high angle and they'll be like, oh, well, uh, that's like top of a building, top of a ladder, um, second floor of a building, whatever. Not necessarily. Technically, this is a high angle in the most technical sense. I'm shooting from above the cat. So it's a high angle. But we want to stress, we'll say a more extreme version so that we can really feel the high angle. This over here is obviously a high angle, also pretty extreme wide, but it's a high angle in re relation to the boat and the water. I'm up on a hill when I shot this. Over on the right in this uh, lab, which was shot by my colleague who I keep referencing, Larry Angle, um, is a high angle in relation to the people working in the lab and uh, all the plants. So thinking about your angles, thinking about getting up and getting low, because we can also, get low for a low angle. Again, relative to the subject. Now on the right here, our, my, my camera, I actually got down on the ground and shot 
from a low angle. On the left, I know when I shot this, uh, it's the same day I shot another shot you're gonna see. I'm sitting on a dock um, in San Francisco, and I sat there and watched this bird above me waiting to catch it in flight. And I caught it, this was a still. But this is a low angle shot from my normal vantage point. But since I'm looking up, it's a low angle in reference to the lamppost and the bird. So an angle is relative to the subject you're shooting, where you place the camera in relation to that. Now, also in relation to subjects, an over the shoulder shot, often used when shooting dialogue or an interview. An over the shoulder shot, technically this is a nice medium of this person, but it incorporates this shoulder in the foreground. Why is this useful? If you're shooting an interview or dialogue, two individuals talking to each other, an over the shoulder shot helps keep us oriented to both subjects. Now, you wanna give yourself variety and we will talk about that in a little bit, but having this as an option helps give us that feeling of space and reminds us that we are working with two people, we're watching two people talk. Another type of shot in incorporating two individuals, usually speaking to each other, is a two shot. Um, <clears throat> now, a two shot really is just a shot that incorporates two characters, but it's a shot term, a descriptive term that we use frequently. So we wanna make sure we stress that to you. When you're planning and you're using these terms, you can think about it. We want a nice two shot of our interview so we see both subjects before we get into the over the shoulder, before we get into the close-ups. Then we got options to edit. We'll get back to that, trust me. So I also have this chart here. Now, most of our shots are generally the terminology is built to relate to a human subject. That's our general way of doing it. All these terms do count for other subjects, other environments, but if you think about it in relation to the body, to a person, extreme close-up usually cuts off, top and bottom gets face or closer. A close-up is sort of shoulders up, a full head, a loose close-up might be referred to as that kind of uh, a little bit below the shoulders, part of the torso. I don't tend to actually say loose close-up. I've never said it actually. I would still call this a close-up for an interview. If we're down here around where the shoulders are, but not down to the elbows, I would still be calling it a close-up. Uh, a tight medium, or a medium, you'll see that it starts to get in more and more of the body. The subject also takes up more and more of the frame and becomes in uh, distance, becomes further away from the camera or the eyes of the viewer in distance. But you'll see that the three medium shots are more or less corresponding to what I showed you, the three different framings of a possible medium shot. You don't have to be too strict about these terms. But knowing them and having an idea of what it should look like will help you communicate to others and help you plan what you're gonna do. Now we're getting into camera movement. This is one of my favorite parts of the lecture because we're not only gonna be able to watch some video, but I'm gonna get a camera in my hands and give you some tips and tricks of how to make your camera movement work well. Right here, we have a little tabletop tripod. Those are great. That's working with the DSLR, but they work well for, S, uh, for smartphones too. But we're gonna use these terms. These are the terms I use. Now, some people do substitute certain terms into them. Uh, I say dolly in or out. Some people might say push in or push out or pull out. A tilt up or down, a pan left or right. A truck left or right, which actually some people will call a crab. And then craning up or down. Um, 
Some, I, though the, I don't think this is as common, at least not in my experience, but I've also seen cranes referred to as pedestaling up and down. Now, I'm throwing these terms at you and you're like, some of you might be out there going, okay, you said those words, what the hell do they mean? Don't worry, I'm getting to it. And then also I wanna to talk to you about zooms and a zoom dolly or vertigo shot, just to see, just to mention that there are possibilities. Okay, so now we're gonna see some videos. Now, first of all, I'm gonna show you these clips and I'm gonna describe what the camera's doing. Then at the end of these clips, I'm gonna stop my slides for a little bit and I'm gonna put a camera in my hand. I'm gonna to talk to you a little bit about shooting deliberately and <clears throat> professionally with the phone in your hand and what some troubles you may have with that. Okay. So dollying out, the camera is moving backwards through a space. So we're going to get moving and here we go. All right, it's very small. In fact, most of these shots I'm gonna show you are not very long, but in this particular case, we started as though we were out in the woods, in the forest, we're out amongst nature, but we dolly out to reveal we're behind a fence or we're behind bars. It revealed something. Many, but not all of these shots will reveal something, at least three of them, maybe four or five. Anyway, um, that is very important. That creates entrances and exits. We will get to that in our third C. So dollying in is a reverse. I'm about to show you a fairly well-known clip in the world of filmmaking that is about a hundred years old, but still a really, really fun dolly shot. In this case, we're dollying in, which means the camera moves forward. All right. So in this case, it still does a sort of reveal, but it's a reveal through staging and through blocking of actors and action on screen. So it incorporates all those people and their little interactions and their uh, direction into the shot as the camera moves past them all, through them all. So it coordinates camera with characters and subjects and acting. Um, next up, we have a tilt up. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit more about the differences between things like a tilt up and a crane up uh, in a little bit, but just bear with me. And we'll, we'll talk about the dynamics in a moment when I have the camera in my hand. But a tilt up pivots the camera upwards. And we're just going to, this is a short little piece of stock footage that just reveals and explores this uh, uh, sculpture. Now I'd like to stress here that just because the camera's moving doesn't mean we ignore things like our rule of thirds. You may have noticed that that came to rest and hold on the sculpture, the head of the statue. It's still using the rule of thirds as to where it wants that statue to be. We need to build all these things and keep them together. We don't ignore our rule of thirds just because we're doing a tilt. We're incorporating our rule of thirds now that we're moving the camera. Pan left, <clears throat> this is a short shot from a French film. I'm a big fan of French films, to be honest. I'm a little biased. Uh, I speak French. I lived there for a little while. I have cousins there. I love French New Wave. So this is a little shot from French New Wave film, Band of Outsiders. And it's a short pan left. It's going to follow the car. Yeah. 
Dix minutes après le soleil. Okay. That's just a little pan left. Now, the other thing you may notice here, I'm showing you short shots, right? For the most part, filmmaking is built of tiny shots, with exceptions, with exceptions. But there's a reason people talk about beautiful long shots and uh, takes that move through a space and are coordinated for a very long take. Famous ones that come to mind. There's one in Children of Men that people like to talk about. There's one in Kill Bill that I use in my classes. There's one in, um, at the beginning of Touch of Evil we show in our classes. The very long shots that are very coordinated. There's a reason they stick out. Long shots are the exception. You create a lot of little puzzle pieces that you piece together to create the full picture of your final story. So most of your shots are actually gonna be fairly short. This is going to be a truck left. This is from Jackie Brown, one of my favorite truck lefts. And in this case, instead of pivoting left, the camera moves through the space to the left. Doing whatever I had to do to survive. I'm not saying what I did was all right. Trying to break out of the ghetto with a day to day fight. Being down so long, getting up to the cost of mine. Okay. So that in that case, the camera doesn't turn, it moves. That's the big difference between the pan and the truck. In both these cases, we're going left. Um, also, you can go right, obviously. You can go left or right. We're gonna move on to a crane though, or a pedestal. There's a series of crane shots here where instead of tilting down or up, which is a pivot, this case, the camera moves through the space. It moves down. These are a few shots from a Chinese film that I found on YouTube the other day, actually. And it's some really good camera work. So you'll see we're coming down to rest on the ground and we're going to reveal our subjects. In this case, it's a young boy and a dog facing off. This is also a crane down, but then with a pan right. So you can incorporate two kinds of shots together. So we get a little bit of a tilt to reframe at the end of that one. You may notice it, you may not, but camera movement is fluid. You don't have to be too strict. If you want to crane down and then pivot to pan right a little to keep your subject in the shot, that's going to work for you. That's great. But being able to isolate the different movements, again, to have a shared terminology so that when you talk to your camera person or your editor and you say things like, I want to do a nice, clean tilt down to the, to the subject's shoes. Let's tilt down to their shoes. We got one character who looks down at the other character's shoes and notices something important about them. They look down, you need that nice shot tilting down to their shoes. So you're talking to the camera person, you communicated well. In editing, you might be working in the edit and think to yourself or say to your editor, we need that tilt down to the shoes. Find the tilt down to the shoes. Well, obviously we know what we're talking about because that's a tilt down. We know the, the movement, we're using the same words. So I'm putting this in here for a reason. Now. A zoom, a zoom happens in camera, not with the camera, meaning the camera does not move in space. A zoom in a smartphone is harder to do fluidly than a traditional camera that has a lens that you turn manually. Now, I've seen some students do decent zooms on their camera. You do the pinch move, right? And they, they, they challenge themselves to do it smoothly. Not impossible. I've seen once in my students over the years, once a student working with a smartphone decided to challenge themselves to a dolly in zoom or dolly out zoom in or dolly in zoom out, meaning the camera moves in one direction and you zoom in the other. And it creates a compacting or expanding of space that is very unique and, and a tough challenge when it comes to the smartphone. So yes, I'm tossing this shot out saying to you, it's gonna to be tough if you decide to do it, 
but I wanted to give you at least one challenge that's a little tough with a smartphone. See if you can do it sometime. It's going to be a little difficult, especially because smartphones, if you're moving with your body and zooming in or out the other direction, a lot to coordinate with your arms, your legs, your movement of your body, and the movement of your fingers. But let's see a really good, well done, dolly out, zoom in from another French film, La N. This film is actually from 1995, so not as old as the previous one. Um, it's the second shot here. So we're gonna see a couple seconds of the previous shot. So after the face, after we cut out of the face, I want you to pay attention to how the background and the environment and its relation to our foreground subjects changes as the camera moves, but zooms in the opposite direction. After this shot. And go. So hopefully you saw that the background here changed in size and relation to the characters. That happens because zooming in or zooming out changes the focal length. And a byproduct of changing that focal length, it compresses or expands space and changes what can be in focus and what will fall out of focus. Adding in the variable of that zoom with an opposite camera movement creates that crazy disorienting vertical feel. Now, again, I'm showing you this and showing you something that you may have trouble trying to do with your smartphone, but I'm tossing out something a little difficult just to say, give it a shot. Because anything you try to do with your camera, with your phone, anything, whether you do it well or you do it poorly and learn from your mistakes, you're going to get experienced. You're going to get better by doing. Okay, so before we do coverage, I'm going to stop my screen share and I'm going to unstop. Okay, you should be seeing me now, hopefully. Um, I'm going to talk to you a little bit about how to get these shots and how to make them uh, look good and feel good to the audience, deliberate. Now, here's the thing. I've got a phone, right? It's only so big and it's only so heavy. <clears throat> the thing about shooting with a smartphone and its weight is that you're not pushing against any weight. With a DSLR or a shoulder camera, your body has weight to push against. And believe it or not, that helps stabilize the shot. But with this, you may not realize how much you've got a little shake in your hand or you're just not as stable as you think you are until you're looking at it on a screen to edit it and it's, it's wobbly. You don't want that wobbly shot. So there's a few things you can do to minimize the wobbliness. And this, uh, actually relates, we'll say to both the, actually it relates to all the seats, in my opinion. You're controlling the camera and keeping it stable or moving smoothly. Um, you're going to have a better shot in your composition. And we didn't get to coverage yet, but it will definitely feed into coverage because, well, the more we shoot, the more we use the things we just said, the more coverage we have. So the first thing, and I am going to actually stand up so that you can see me in action. All right, here we go. So shake it out a little. You ready? First thing, don't shoot like this. You may not realize it, but that's going to cause potential problems with your arms. You won't know until, you're, until it's too late. It's also a lot about center of gravity. Bring it in. Use your center of gravity, okay? You can keep it up high, you can keep it down low, whatever works for you, but use your body. Don't do this. Do this. I guarantee, guarantee you 
that will be a better shot if you use your full body. You can't tell it, but I'm, I'm wide, widening my stance a little to help stabilize me. Think about a tripod. You are the stabilizing element, not the device now. So you want to widen my stance a little so I have a nice center of gravity, I have a good balance. I'm gonna get that pan left or pan right, okay? That's gonna help. So first off, center of gravity. Try to use it if you can. Second, in addition to that, keeping it relatively close to your center of gravity, if you want, are going to do a dolly in, dolly out, and you don't have a dolly, though we're still using it as a term, push in, pull out, move forward, whatever, whatever, that's moving through space. That is the camera moving closer to the subject. Now, a lot of beginners will just kind of push with their arms. Actually, not as stable that as if I put a foot forward, put a foot back, center of gravity, and use my whole body to lean in. I'm telling you 100%, this will be more stable. This shot is not as stable as this shot. And I know you can only see so much of me, but I've got my legs spread. I'm using my whole body to do the shot. Now, one thing about this is some students will get a little self-conscious because you can end up in some sort of ridiculous looking positions. Let go of that. Get acrobatic about it. Get, we'll say, a little bit gestural with it. Get into the shot. Make that move bigger and use your whole body. I've got my legs very spread right now to do this. Get down and get up. Not this, not this, this. Right? That's going to be a better shot, guaranteed. Now, other things to help you stabilize, to not have that wobbliness, to not be shaky. Um, simply setting it on a, something that will hold it. I frame up the shot, I hit record, set it down, I'll cut out the beginning later. Get your hands off it if you can. If you don't have a tripod or a, one of the adapters that grips it, which I do have options like that, but I want you to shoot without things. If you don't have the stuff, you don't need the stuff. If you can make um, adjustments. <clears throat> I've set my camera, my phone against the soda can, against the books. I've piled books up, set it on top of books, whatever you can get, but maybe that's not an option. Let's see here if I can get you. I'm at a table. I'm putting my elbows on the table. This, this will help steady the shot. Can't get you far enough away to see all of it, but this will help steady the shot. Locking myself down, holding against the table. Likewise, and this is my go-to when I'm shooting. Find a wall and shoot your shots that way. Shoulder against the wall, frame it up. And although you can't necessarily see, I have one leg right up against the wall and the other one at an angle, pushing me a little bit against the wall. That little bit of pressure is going to help stabilize your shot. Now also here, I can go ahead and add in some movement. I would probably take this off the wall because I could hear it clanging behind me. That would definitely come in to interrupt my sound. So let me see if I can get a little away from it and incorporate a full body move, a little pan, but you know what? This pan to the right gets the entire room. I've just panned the whole room because it's less about space and more about degrees. Um, finally, I'll just stress something. Pans, pivot, Camera stays in the same space, but turns. Tilts, pivot. Camera stays in the same space, looks up and down, as opposed to 
because I also want you to see the camera do these things. I know we already watched them in action. A truck left or right instead of a pan does this. Moves through the space, left or right. That's the difference between the pan and the truck. Tilt and the other one, craning. So not only is it important to have these terms and to know the difference, but they reveal information differently in how they interact with the subjects. And you may find that you have more vocabulary in your head, you have more options in your plan, you get more coverage in your shots. Okay, how are we doing? Oh, we're doing all right, okay. I'm gonna go back to sharing my screen. Okay, so now we're gonna talk about coverage. This is the third and final C. You made it all the way to the third C. Good for you. Good for you. I'm glad you're still here. So coverage, what is coverage gonna do for you and how do we do it? One thing, shoot for the edit. Shoot footage that's going to help you edit well and make it flow. It starts in your planning. It starts with your storyboard and your shot list to plan, to shoot for the edit, so that when you sit down to, to uh, edit, no matter what you're editing in, you've planned for it. Now, there are ways to do it on the fly, and there's ways to follow some rules that help for the edit. So two rules we have are the 180 rule and the 30 degree rule. We're gonna see charts for those in a moment, little diagrams. Create entrances and exits or reveals. That means, if you have a chance, have your characters, your subjects enter the frame so that you have an entrance, also have them exit the frame. This helps at the beginning and the end of footage, of scenes. If you can't have them physically do that, do it through movement. Reveal, bring them into the shot and reveal them. It's a type of entrance or Get them out of the shot, creates an exit. Segment your world and create shot, to create options. Here's another thing that I see beginners do that I wanna put in your brains to think beyond. A lot of beginners, when they shoot, they shoot about their own eye level and around normal conversational distance to their subjects. Culturally, that can change, but my experience, it's around two to three feet, two and a half to three feet away from them. But here's the thing. You get more options if you get away from that. Lay down on the ground, stand up on a table, get down in the corner, get really close to your subjects, get really far, as far away as you can. These create options. More options. More options gives you more ideas, gives you more places to go in your edit. So breaking that world up into different parts from different angles all over the place. And here's the thing, for every 100 shots you shoot, you probably use less than 20, maybe even less than 10. But all those options will help lead you to the best 10. And that's what you want. So segmenting it into as many possible options as you can, do that. And hold shots longer than you want to. Here's the thing. I'll go back to, the, to me for a moment. I have students that I see do this. Let's say I'm gonna do, to keep, I'm gonna keep seated and do a nice simple pan, right? I'm gonna do a pan, pan left. This is my pan left. Great, cool. What I see students do a lot of, and I can tell in their footage, start recording, pan, done, stop recording, back. Why is that bad? I started recording, immediately started moving. As soon as I stopped moving, I stopped recording. Not good for your edit and not good for your coverage. You want time before and after the move. Before and after the action, whatever the action is, whether the action is happening with the camera or whether it's happening in front of the camera, 
You want time before and after whatever action. In this case, the camera is the action. So instead of what I just did, here's what I tell people to do. Recording. Do my pan. Stop recording. I counted to 10 on both ends. I gave myself 10 seconds of a shot on either side of that action. You don't necessarily have to go that long. 10 seconds is longer than you think it is, and it adds up. But hold the shot longer than you think you need to. Hold it before whatever happens and hold it after. The other thing is smartphones tend to show you the last frame of the shot when you're not recording. So it may look like the shot's longer than it is. And then you get into editing. You're like, oh my God, I cut that off. If only I had two more seconds. If only I had two more seconds. I need that two seconds. You can't go back and create those two seconds if it's already passed. If it's too late to go back and shoot again. So hold it longer than you think you have to. Okay, there we go. So what, let's, we're gonna loop back in coverage to shoot for the edit, the 180 rule, the 30 degree rule. The 180 rule, <clears throat> this is often referring to scenes where we have dialogue, but it also counts for interviews. It counts for any two subjects that are looking at each other. When you start on one side of their eye line, one side of them, you have 180 degrees to place your camera so that their screen direction remains constant. They are looking at each other, even when we get into a close up where we don't see both characters, both subjects. If we jump over that line to the other side, their screen direction changes. Now, in a two shot, we might be like, okay, so what? It doesn't matter that much. But trust me, in the close-ups or the interview where they're looking at each other and want those eyes to match and look like they're looking at each other, you want to keep the screen directions consistent. And when we don't see one character, we only see the other one, it's consistent. It doesn't suddenly become, they look like they're talking in the back of their, each other's heads, actually, if you jump the line. So once you establish on one side, stick with it. In addition to that, we have the 30 degree rule. 30 degree rule says the camera needs to be 30 degrees or more in each of its positioning in order for an edit to not feel jumpy. This one I feel is a little less instinctual on set when you're shooting. You may not realize whether or not it's 30 degrees. One simple rule, <coughs> is if you place yourself where the subject is, wherever that center is, like here, or, that, or their characters are, and you do this. The angle created by your fingers, sorry, these fingers, I did that by accident, these fingers, these two fingers, that angle, about 30 degrees. Everybody's gonna be a little different, right? It's not precise, but we want, so if we knew the camera's right there, we don't want the camera until over here. So let's move it over there. And that's why you plan your shots on the fly, is your 30 degrees, you must be over 30 degrees. I'll be honest, I've only done this in lectures. I've never done this on set. I just know I need to move my camera a significant amount, not a couple steps, a good five or six steps, so that it'll edit well together. Some extra tips to think about when framing up your shots. Look for framing opportunities <clears throat> in your environment or create them. On the left, we're literally looking through an architectural frame on that building out to the Empire State Building. <clears throat> it creates a nice foreground background. It frames a composition within a composition. It separates this nice uh, negative space. On the right, <clears throat> These two buskers, these two violinists were playing in the street in New Orleans. And I liked how the buildings created a frame around them. And I actually chose to put them on the rule of thirds over here and put this other 
object in the foreground, this lamppost with, I don't know what that is right now, um, firebox maybe, I'm not sure, uh, on the other rule of thirds. But I was creating a frame using the environment that they already had around them. It was there for me to take advantage of. Pay attention to leading lines and linear perspective. We already saw one shot where leading lines played in the shot in Pittsburgh with the subject in the foreground and the, the line that brought us back to the building. In this case, and this is the same place I was sitting when I took a picture of that seagull, was sitting on one of these lampposts. Anyway, there's a lot of leading lines here. This linear perspective is so extreme, so consistent. Everything goes back to the center and then shoots right up that building off the screen. It's it's well composed, if I say so myself. But look for those leading lines. They don't have to be directly going in the background. They can also be on diagonals. But it'll help you use the geometry of your environment. Negative space and how subjects cut off. In this particular case, it's a sign against the sky. The, the rule of thirds is active. I'm allowing this to enter and exit the frame by the corner and use that negative space. There's a balance by keeping the corner really busy and tight and the negative space up there to flow and be empty. So think about your negative space. Think about how subjects enter or exit a frame and how you cut them off or crop them. And then embrace cool mistakes. Now, these aren't necessarily major mistakes, but some might say you don't often want to backlight something, especially a person, unless you're keeping their identity a secret, right? You want to backlight. But in this particular case, this pirate ship, I don't remember if this is really a pirate ship or just a boat of sorts, but I like to say it's a pirate ship. Um, it's backlit with this real, a lot of personality and texture in the sky, and it became really dramatic by having something backlit. The flip side of it, going back to Pittsburgh, this building here has a glare. Sometimes we say glares are mistakes, but you know what? In this case, I liked it. I thought it added the shot. It gave this really strong highlight and balanced out the dark shadows and just gave it some energy that I thought was way more interesting than framing things so that I didn't have that, that highlight, that flare. And that is the end of my slides. I'm gonna take just one moment and talk to you about gear. We already mentioned adding apps to your phone, like Filmic Pro, our friends at Filmic Pro, our friends at LumaFusion, if you want to edit on your phone or on a tablet. Um, but in addition to apps, there is gear out there. I already mentioned tripods. You can get tripods for your smartphones. I have a couple bits and pieces of gear sitting here. They're small, they're compact. I'm just going to show them to you. One is my Beast Grip. This is a modular unit that allows me to add lenses. I'm not necessarily endorsing Beast Grip, but you can look them up. You can also do a general search. There's so many things out there in the world these days, so many different options. Um, I still have this set to an older, smaller camera that I use from time to time still. It clicks into the back, you line it up with the lens, and then you shoot. And I also, I can mount uh, a light or a mic here. And one of the nice things about it is it gives the camera some more weight. It's a little heavier. So those nice moves I was talking about are actually going to be smoother because I've added a little weight to it. So that's my beast grip. I have a variety of lenses, tiny lenses, pocket lenses, I like to call them. This is a telephoto lens that screws onto a camera case. Um, there are a lot of those out on the market. This is from Cam Kicks, who I really like their products. They're very nicely made lenses. Um, and I've got two telephotos here in my kit. Screw right on to get into the environment. What else? Have I have? Oh, I have two more things. Two more, two more, two more. I have a small on-camera ring light. Little bright, I know, but here's the nice thing about this. I can 
adjust its intensity and its color balance. I don't know if you can see, but I've got three different color settings. And if I'm shooting an interview, got a nice ring light on me. Little too drastic, turn it down. Shooting in daylight, make it blue. It charges through USB. I also put it on my computer sometimes to light myself in Zooms. So I just look a little better when I'm teaching distance classes. So some lighting doesn't hurt. And then the final thing, and this I use a lot, it is a gimbal or a Steadicam. Hold on. Hold on, hold on, hold on. I got to get it up and running. This. I need to put the, the phone on it, though. Um, Hold on, get it in there. Hold on. Should have had this preset. This is why assistants are useful too. Bring an assistant along to set your gear up for you. It's a good idea. Make your little, you make your younger sibling do it for you. Maybe not. They might drop your gear. Okay, let's see. Can I get up and running? There we go. There we go. There we go. Okay. Get nice, smooth shots moving through a space. I actually really love this because I use it to take, uh, to do traveling shots where I walk. I can also, let's see, can you see this? Get some nice tilts, some nice pans. Now this is a little bit higher end gear, it's true. That's fine, I'm not necessarily endorsing you run out and spend a bunch of money on gear. I don't think you have to. I think you have a lot of power and a lot of options right in your pocket, right in your pocket. But I want you to know that there's more things that add to the phone, that add to your options, that will make it even more dynamic than it already is. So with that being said, <clears throat> Um, my crew that has been watching the YouTube, did we have any questions by chance? Anything pop up in the chat? And if not, that's okay. That brings us just short of the two hour mark, which is what I was hoping in case we had any questions. Hey, Kylos. Or if, or if anyone wants anything to add. Yes, Larry. Yeah. So, um, there were a couple of queries about elaborating a little bit more about the 30 degree rule in editing. Okay. And basically, what I was saying was that you you in editing you want to make sure you change the axis, the camera subject relation. So maybe you could point that out that if we're um, using the your webcam as a, a main angle, you don't want to put a close up on that same angle. So maybe you could talk a little bit more about that. Okay. So what Larry is explaining is basically um, you want to be able to swap. Uh, sorry, I, I got myself confused in my language. It's okay. <clears throat> the changing of the angles is so that your edit looks smooth. So what you want to do is in your angles, when you go from that wide shot of your subject to your close up, you might want to change your angle by 30 degrees or more so that the edit moves with the camera. Is this making sense? I hope I'm getting a nod. Okay. Um, I think I got a little tripped up in my own language on that one. That's an accident. That's okay. But yeah, uh, you know, here's what it is you change the axis of the angle to create more options. And if you don't change it drastic enough, it won't edit together well. Um, any other things pop up in the chat? I think you're muted, Larry. I'm not sure what you're saying. Yeah, I wasn't talking. I, uh, when I go over to YouTube, the delay is so severe, it confuses me too. Yeah, I have it playing on the side. Yeah, 
Yeah. So, um, I no, we were talking about a lot of uh, DIY stuff. I've been kind of elaborating in the chat. Oh, good, on, good. On that you've been, uh, you know, elaborating and presenting. Um, okay. Let me go back to the chat and see if folks have other specific questions, and I'll report back momentarily. Sure. And I've set things up that you can come on screen, so you can you can jump in if you want. I think we're in pretty good shape. Uh, That's fine. That's good. I think that was really that that covered everything that I wanted to cover. I'm going to pin myself back up here. Okay. So I want to just say thank you all so much. Um, two things to follow up on from this session. I know I know you have future sessions coming, and you're going to learn a deeper dive in different concepts from the What Up program. And I mean, this is really exciting. I'm really, really honored to be the kickoff bird's eye view, get you out there and shooting person. I'm very excited that you're going to learn from other people and they're going to get you diving in deeper on things. I'm going to leave you with two things. If you want to get out there shooting and you want to get inspiration. One is if you want to just start right away or soon, but you don't have an idea, you don't necessarily need an idea right away. But what I have, and I've given this to our, our smart film uh, group, our crew, our people working with us, um, I've given two documents. One is just about shooting footage and matching up different types of shots with different types of visual content. Uh, it's a little exercise I give my students when I do these workshops. The other exercise is a simple interview with just a series of questions. Now these, you don't have to do these. These are not required, obviously. You aren't being graded. But if you want to shoot and you don't have an idea, they're gonna pass these uh, documents to you and you can get out there and start shooting as soon as you have them in front of you and come up with an idea. Uh, the second thing I'm gonna say is we get inspiration from anything we watch, but direct inspiration from others who have been using smartphones to shoot with is probably a really great place to go. You're already on the Smart Film YouTube channel. So before you leave us today, take a look at some of the videos they have from previous smartphone or Smart Film Fests and see what other people did with their phones. Take inspiration from it. Watch it. Think, can I do that better? Tell yourself you can do it better. And then go out there and try to do it better. And if you don't do it better, learn from what you did and then do it better tomorrow. That's the way we get to be amazing filmmakers is shooting a lot, shooting over and over again, looking at our successes and our failures, learning from it and moving forward. So good luck shooting. Thank you so much for joining us today. Look forward to seeing you in the future What Up programs. I myself will be present for this in-person September programs, and I look forward to meeting people face-to-face. -face. Hope you're all doing well, and I hope this was beneficial to you, and I hope you get out there and get shooting right away. Thank you.